Bob, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So uh, we'll go ahead and kick it off because it is right at four. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Taylor Clem with UF IFAS Extension in Alachua County. I'm the Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator here. And today's program, uh, we have Bob Watson. He's going to be speaking all about uh, citrus in our backyards. Bob has a lot of experience growing citrus, and he's a um, with his experience and his knowledge, he's a wonderful presenter to have to come and share this information with you all. So welcome everybody, thank you for coming and feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box for us. Bob, feel free to go ahead and take it over from here. Well, thank you, Taylor, and good afternoon, everybody. This is a pretty timely uh, presentation because next month is really when things kind of kick off for the citrus world. Uh, you ought to be able to see your uh, dead wood and, and uh, see if your trees that are existing have, have survived the winter. But also if you intend to plant citrus, uh, probably February, March are good times to be thinking about it seriously. Uh, this is really more of an introductory course and kind of give you an overall view of, of uh, uh, how to grow citrus in a backyard environment. And we'll have a, a little bit of an outline that I'll, I'll go over with you uh, just to discuss some of the uh, the items. Well, uh, let's see, this thing is not working here. Uh, let's see. You may have to click on the PowerPoint there screen. There we go. There you go. Okay, I got it. Okay, here's our outline. We're Briefly, we're going to talk about the history of citrus in Florida uh, and then selecting a tree, uh, some of the, the considerations and in, in, uh, choosing what kind of a tree, and then site selection in your yard uh, types and varieties of citrus that are suitable for our area, uh, watering and nutrition for the trees, and weed and pest control uh, or disease management issues, uh, pruning, which is something you need to be very careful of. Uh, you don't want to over prune these things. And then a little bit about citrus greening. Uh, just moving along uh, in the history side of things, uh, as most everybody knows, the uh, Florida state flower is the orange blossom. And citrus has been around here uh, for quite some time. Uh, citrus plants are uh, brought to Florida here by the Spaniards over 400 years ago. Uh, citrus itself was thought to have originated in various parts of Asia. Uh, and Christopher Columbus actually brought the uh, citrus trees to the new world on his 1493 journey. Ponce de Leon was uh, thought to have planted his first orange trees in St. Augustine in 1513. So uh, some of the other little history about it is uh, comments about citrus, uh, first written comments were uh, people who were travelers to St. Augustine back in the 1500s. So it's been around a good while. Uh, even Will William Bartram uh, described an enormous citrus grove near New Smyrna which he said was nearly a half mile wide and 40 miles long. Now, I don't know what they were doing back in the late 1700s because I'm not sure how they shipped citrus in that quantity back then, but he noticed it and, and wrote about it. Uh, commercial citrus really took off in Florida with the coming of the railroads after the Civil War when they could actually move the citrus uh, to the north and other areas. <clears throat> Here's some pictures of some of the classic old uh, Florida citrus labels. Uh, one thing uh, that you have to be mindful of is uh, in order to be able to plant citrus now, you have to be a, a serious optimist. Uh, back in the old days, you uh, used to be able, and I say old days, 20 years ago or so, you could just plant a tree and almost forget about it. it uh, and now there are so many disorders, pests, and diseases uh, in addition to the cold issues, which is something that have, has continually plagued citrus in our area, that you really have to be a pretty serious worker uh, to make citrus uh, productive in your yard now. A little bit more about it. Uh, Lachua County used to be one of the major citrus growing areas here in Florida. Uh, and that was prior to the big freezes of 1894-95. Uh, I don't know how many of you have walked around in the north side of, of uh, Payne's Prairie, where the state park is there. You can see the old uh, railroad beds, and some of that used to carry the citrus from our area to the St. John's River. Uh, they also, 
there were ferry boats that uh, carried fruit from Orange and Loch Lusa lakes uh, along, along various canals to these railheads, and then they would ship them over to Palatka and, and St. John's River and move them up north. The, um, Bob, this is yeah. this is a question from me. Yeah, <laughs> is that the um, the are you talking about the railroad bed on Withlacoochee or no 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 on the north side of uh, Paynes Prairie where the Paynes Prairie State Park is? Have you uh, been to the the uh, uh, the Paynes Prairie? Oh 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 oh! oh. I know which side? one it is. Sorry, yeah, Machua, thinking, Machua Trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking Wakahuda. No. Uh, station well, that, road line, but they're okay. probably merged somewhere. Thank you. That yeah. was my question. <laughs> okay. But anyway, the uh, citrus uh, is moved south pretty much after these severe freezes, and uh, they still were trying to run it up here in the 1950s, but it uh, it pretty much moved south of uh, of uh, I four uh, probably after the 1960s, 70s, and 80s because there were some freezes in that time frame as well. But Citrus is uh, still really an important crop here for Florida, but it's de it decreased substantially over the last 20 years due to both disease and displacement due to population growth. Uh, some of the diseases that have really plagued our, our, the industry here are citrus canker, which really uh, hit the uh, industry hard probably 20 years ago. Uh, the fruit fly was uh, prior to that, and now we have citrus greening. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the presentation. Um, I think I would mentioned before that citrus used to be very easy to grow uh, for us amateurs. And really up until probably 20 years ago, you could just pop a tree in the ground and, and fertilize it and water it and really didn't have to worry too much about it. Uh, now we have to, to tend our trees carefully and monitor what's going on to make sure that uh, we don't have nutritional or, or, uh, or pests or diseases attacking it. <clears throat> One of the things that's happened here uh, in the, say the past 50 years is commerce has become more globalized and transport is much faster. These new diseases uh, and pests come along uh, our transport just as quickly, just like much like the pandemic that we're going through right now. Uh, it only takes a couple hours to get from one part of the world to another, and you can bring all sorts of diseases and pests, like the, uh, the greening issue. Back before 1900, it took weeks or months to transport plants, so they had a sort of a natural quarantine period. Let's talk about selecting trees a bit. Probably the first consideration that you might want to talk about or think about is select a variety that you would like to eat. Uh, we've all tried various types of citrus and you can go to uh, various uh, grow stands and, and, uh, and or uh, grocery stores and try certain citruses. Try them and see what flavors you like, what you're looking for, and, uh, and then see if it's gonna be suitable for our area. Uh, one of the things you will probably want to do is, is, is select a cold hardy variety, unless you're gonna be growing it in a, a container or in a greenhouse. or what do you call them, orangerium? What do you call those things that uh, they used to have in France? Uh, orangerie. Orangerie, there you go. Uh, I knew uh, that uh, Taylor would know. But another thing to consider are the rootstocks. Uh, when you're looking at them, a lot of times your choices will be limited if you're buying them in a big box store or even in nurseries around here. But you might want to ask and, and take note of it. Look at the uh, at the rootstocks that there, and what you can also do is check with IFAS and some of their publications to see what uh, what rootstock uh, might convey certain characteristics to the fruit itself uh, or the tree. Some rootstocks um, can affect the tree size. There's a, a rootstock called flying dragon that can cause citrus trees to flower and fruit much earlier, as well as the uh, the trees will be much smaller. Uh, sometimes they will rarely exceed five feet in height. So that's a, a consideration when you're planting the trees. Uh, some of these trees can grow 25 feet or more and uh, harvesting them, uh, the fruit can become a real issue for most of us. Um, but these rootstocks were developed to allow the trees to become more resistant to various types of diseases. And IFAS is experimenting continuously with, uh, with various rootstocks. Uh, especially right now in the, uh, the situation with all the greening that we're experiencing. 
Uh, some of the cultivars, some trees require cross-pollination with a suitable variety. And uh, the tree that you may be trying to cross-pollinate it with may, be a, uh, may, may not be as cold hardy as the one that you're trying to plant. So you got to make sure it's uh, appropriate for the area as well. Some varieties uh, seem to be a little bit more uh, susceptible to certain types of fungal or other diseases and may need more spraying for pests and or uh, fungal diseases. Let's talk a little bit about site selection. Uh, IFAS recommends at least 15 feet between trees so that you can get uh, space to grow and, and air to circulate in, in and amongst the trees. Uh, citrus trees tolerate shade, but they produce better with more sun. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, cert certain types of shade may help with greening issues. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. However, uh, again, if you look at all the commercial growers, they like to have them in full sun and you will get a lot more fruit in full sun. Uh, one other thing in the site selection is, is make sure it's well drained because you don't want to have a, a wet uh, foot or a wet trunk of the tree because you can get foot or root rot issues uh, easily. One thing to consider too is, is you can create a microclimate based on your site selection. The uh, south side of, uh, of a house or west side typically are the warmest, but you want to be careful that you don't plant too closely to your house uh, like this following slide. This is a picture of a microclimate here in Gainesville of a key lime tree. Uh, it's actually uh, my house. Uh, we threw this key lime tree away. We had it in a pot thinking that we would uh, have a very productive tree, but uh, probably this was about 15 years ago. Our dogs kept chewing on this little tree and my wife told me to throw it away and I, I just tossed it out in, the, uh, out in the back somewhere and thinking it was gonna die. And I noticed some little green leaves coming, sprouting back on the twig. So I just popped it beside the house and uh, forgot about it. And a year or two later, it was flourishing and it, it does extremely well. Uh, it's a very productive tree, but uh, we have to, have to trim the, uh, the branches that are close to the house. However, uh, again, it's, uh, it shouldn't be growing here in Gainesville, yet it does. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, types and varieties of citrus. Uh, we'll talk about some that uh, are the more popular varieties uh, in our area. And we'll also talk about some that, uh, uh, I'll, I've bolded some of these that, uh, well, we'll talk sweet oranges, grapefruits, specialty fruits, and then uh, acid fruits. The, uh, the ones that I have in the uh, next pages, I'll have some in bold, and those are the ones that are probably the most suitable for our area or most popular. Uh, there are a lot more than the ones that we have just, uh, that we're listing here. And what you might want to consider doing is look at the, uh, at the IFAS publication, and I've listed them in the very back, but there is a, a, a citrus culture and the home landscape. It's IFAS pub HS867, and they have a, a very nice list of all the, uh, uh, the varieties and some of the considerations as far as the, uh, uh, what time of year they produce. Uh, typically, we want to get an early season producer, uh, and but certainly something that you, you would finish harvesting by January, uh, because when we get into February, it's kind of tough. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about navels first and, uh, and hamlins. Uh, Parson Brown used to be a very popular one in this area, but uh, it's an early producer, but it's not quite as productive a tree now and, and not as popular as it used to be. You can still buy all of these at certain nurseries. Let's talk a little bit about red navels uh, and navels in general. Uh, they come in, in several varieties. Uh, most of them are early season. Uh, it's the uh, Washington, the Glen, Red, Cara Cara, and Lane, which is a later producer uh, of the uh, navel varieties. But not all may be available at your local nurseries. Uh, but you may be able to find some online or take a trip to one of the nurseries around. Uh, 
before you uh, take the trip out there, give them a call. I, I went one time down to a nursery in the, the Bradenton area and was able to find just about everything I ever wanted. But sometimes the nurseries, especially the, the real big nurseries that, that grow out the, the plants, don't want too many visitors because they're afraid that you might bring contaminants into their nursery area. Some of the navel trees can grow up to about 25 feet uh, unless you obtain one of the dwarf rootstocks. Uh, navels are also susceptible to what they call post bloom fruit drop. So you'll see uh, uh, a lot of times the fruits will drop off of them. Uh, this is a red navel that came from our yard. And if you'll notice, one of the things that also happens in navels and certain other varieties is you get granulation. And it can be caused by uh, several factors. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Here's a picture of a Hamelin orange. Uh, they're very juicy, uh, nice flavor, very, but very low acid. Uh, they produce early and, and are very suitable for our North Florida climate. They are also susceptible to fruit drop late in the season. Uh, but one of the things I've noticed is that you really, uh, the, the fruit doesn't really hold on the tree that well in cold periods. Uh, it, the season is October through January, but Sometimes we have to pick it uh, really before mid-January because the, uh, uh, if you have a freeze or two, the, the fruit will, will uh, deteriorate pretty rapidly. I, on our tree, we can typically harvest around Thanksgiving and then uh, the, the completion of, of, uh, uh, of the fruiting is, is uh, after Christmas. And again, depends on the freezes. This is a tree that I planted underneath an oak tree uh, Whereas most of the trees in our yard seem to be affected by citrus greening to some effect, or some effect uh, uh, one way or the other, this, this tree seems to be totally unaffected by it, which is uh, something we can talk about a little bit more later. Let's talk about grapefruits a little bit. Uh, grapefruits are typically very cold hardy fruits. Uh, a little history about the grapefruit is it was first reported growing in Barbados in the mid 1700s. It was really unknown in Asia or Europe prior to that, and it was called the forbidden fruit by the people in Barbados. I'm not sure if this was a biblical reference or just that the fruit was more sour than the sweet oranges and a much larger fruit. <clears throat> it, it was first introduced to Florida in the uh, 1820s in the Tampa Bay area and took off commercially uh, in the like the 1880s. Florida leads the world in grapefruit production and has since the 1880s. Just about all the, the varieties of grapefruit are cold hardy and can be grown in our area. Some of the red grapefruits are a little bit harder to grow. I think they sometimes have a, a thinner uh, rind and maybe uh, that makes them uh, a little bit more susceptible to either diseases or, or frost air type issues. Uh, there are a lot more varieties than the ones that we've listed here. I'm going to talk about the, the ones that are in bold. Uh, you can check with your nursery to see what's available and what you would like to eat. The ruby reds are, are fairly popular. Uh, you might want to try those. I didn't, I didn't, I'm not going to talk about those, but look at the uh, IFAS publications to read about those because they sometimes have, have uh, maybe uh, more disease exposure than, than some of the others. The uh, Duncan grapefruit is, uh, is one that's very popular. It's the oldest cultivar, uh, and it's one of the sweeter grapefruits. It's very seedy. Uh, it has typically some 30 to 70 seeds per fruit, which is, uh, makes it not so popular in the fresh fruit market. Uh, but like all grapefruit, it's susceptible to scab, greasy spot, and melanose fungus. So you may need to prepare to spray with oil and or copper fungicide. Um, I've got a couple of these marsh grapefruits in our yard and they seem to do very well here. They're very cold hardy. Uh, and when they mature, they tend to hold well on the tree. You can see that they, they, uh, the, the growing season or the, the, not the growing season, but the harvest season is November through May. So that's quite a long period that the, the fruit will stay on the tree. We can pick ours in May <clears throat> or sometimes even in June, but the, the, uh, the, the fruit tends to become 
somewhat bland and less acidic. So you don't get the, the, the tang that you normally would expect to get from grapefruit. The marsh grapefruit uh, originated as a chance seedling in the Lakeland area in the 1860s. And it is the most widely planted cultivar. Uh, again, because it's a grapefruit, it's susceptible to scab, greasy spot, and melanose. But one of the things that does not have very many seeds, typically one to, to six seeds per fruit. <clears throat> Here's another grapefruit that we have in our yard, and it's a Thompson grapefruit, which is also called a pink marsh, and has a very similar uh, uh, taste and, uh, and growing period and number of seeds as the regular marsh. It's very cold hardy. Uh, it's got a fairly thick rind on it too, which means that uh, it's you know, it holds up to the freezes much better than a lot of other fruits do. Uh, again, it can hold well on the tree pretty late in the year, but it loses acidity and, uh, and gets bland. So if you're, uh, if you want to have a fruit that you can uh, enjoy for a long period of time, these grapefruits work very nicely. The, uh, the Thompson grapefruit actually originated as a limb sport, which is just sort of spontaneous growth from a marsh grapefruit tree here in Florida. Uh, the ruby red grapefruits and the related varieties typically have a much deeper uh, flesh color and they developed as limb sports from the, uh, the pink marsh or the Thompson grapefruit. Uh, they tend to have much, again, much deeper red colors, but their sugar and acid content may differ. The fruits tend to be somewhat smaller in size than the, uh, than the Thompson varieties. Uh, and they are very popular. Uh, they grow them a lot in, in Texas and also in our area. The, uh, they are susceptible to scab and greasy spots. So again, prepare to uh, want to spray these things if, if uh, you're going to grow grapefruit. Let's talk about some of the specialty fruits. These are probably some of the more popular ones here in, uh, in our North Florida area. Now the, the ones that I've bolded in uh, on this outline uh, are the ones that we'll talk about, and they are typically cold hardy and earlier producers. Uh, there, we're going to discuss some more newer varieties a little later when we get into this citrus greening portion of the discussion, that uh, these newer varieties are being developed by IFAS, the USDA, and others. Uh, they are somewhat resistant to greening. Uh, there's nothing, there's no uh, Nothing that's totally bulletproof at this point, but they're uh, they're working on these varieties. Some of the I've tried one or two of these new varieties at a, a citrus conference they had in Lake Alfred a year or so ago, and some of the taste is not quite as sweet or as as uh, familiar as uh, the fruit that you like. Although some of them seem to be fairly decent. Uh, let's talk a little about the Satsuma. That's probably one of the more popular ones, and it's a very cold hardy tree. It's uh, a medium-sized tree, which is, is nice. Very few seeds per fruit. The fruit quality is good. It self-pollinates, which is important. It is susceptible to alternaria and, uh, and scab. Uh, they're actually growing satsumas up in uh, uh, not only in North Florida, but also commercially in South Georgia now. So it's a very, very cold hardy tree and something that you might want to consider uh, if you want to grow an orange type tree in your backyard. Uh, another one to think about is a sunburst tangerine. It's an like early season producer. It's the tree itself is moderately cold hardy. The uh, it has variable seeds in the, in the fruits, one to 20. The fruit's very high quality, uh, does require pollinizer. And the pollinizer tree would typically be an Orlando or a Mineola uh, type tree. Uh, it is susceptible to rust, uh, which is a fungal disease, citrus mites as well as it does, because sometimes it, it, it gets uh, heavy production, you can have limb breakage. The uh, root stock on these trees can vary. So you might want to, to check and make sure it's suitable for North Florida and whatever diseases you might expect to see around here. The Orlando Tangelo is another very popular variety. It's an early to mid-season uh, variety. It's a very, the tree can be very large. Often the fruit has many seeds. 
It's a good quality fruit and it does have some uh, uh, susceptibility to alternate area and greasy spot. Uh, it, it also requires a pollinizer like a temple or a sunburst. Temples typically are a, a, a later producer, so they may not be as cold hardy a tree. Uh, so you have to be mindful of that when you plant these things. Uh, Mineola tangelo, also known as the honey bell, uh, it's a, actually a cross between a Duncan grapefruit and a Dancy tangerine. It does need a pollinizer like a temple or a sunburst. They're uh, uh, mid-season, meaning they typically harvest between December and February. It's uh, an excellent eating fruit and it's fairly cold hardy. The trees do tend to be fairly tall and you do need a, a, a cross pollinize with a, a temple or a sunburst. Uh, again, it's susceptible to scab, fungus and alternaria. The ta dancy tangerine is a fairly popular one. It's an older, uh, probably one of the oldest tangerine varieties uh, dating back to the, the late 1860s where they found it in the grove of Colonel Dancy over in Orange Mills, Florida. Uh, it doesn't have too many seeds, typically six to 20. Uh, it's easy to peel, it does not require cross-pollination uh, and it's alternate bearing. And alternate bearing means that it has a tendency to produce large crops of small fruit in one year and a, uh, and a small crop of large fruit the following year. Tree is moderately cold hardy, hardy but the fruit is not due to the thin skin of the, uh, the fruit. I have one of these in our yard and it seems to have, have uh, fared well during the, the cold. But again, if, if you have a bunch of freezes, uh, the fruit doesn't fare too well but it's a very nice uh, and sort of your traditional tangerine. Uh, and here's one of my favorite fruits. Uh, it's not a very popular one, but uh, it's, it can grow in our area. It's an early producer. It uh, produces in October. So you can, in late October, you can start harvesting these things. Uh, doesn't have too many seeds, can be from zero to 25 per, per fruit very juicy and has probably one of the best flavors of, of oranges I've uh, ever tasted. One of the problems that you have is fruit size can vary uh, within this thing and that's why it's not been a, a commercial success. Uh, you can mitigate that, that uh, fruit size variability somewhat by having a, a, a if it's near a pollinizer such as a Lee or an Orlando or a Temple Orange but some of those the Lee and the Temples are typically a, a, a later season and may not grow too well up here. The, uh, uh, it is very susceptible to scab. And if you, uh, if you were to acquire one of these things, you uh, had better be prepared to, uh, to spray with a copper fungicide at uh, appropriate intervals, typically when the first leaf flush comes in the spring and then at, at petal drop, uh, and then a few weeks after that. So you typically have a three week uh, or three, three intervals in which you have to, to spray the, uh, the thing for scab. Some people say that you can use neem oil. I've tried it, but I don't, I've, I've never really been that successful at, at uh, preventing scab with that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the acid fruits, the limes and lemons, as well as a few others. The uh, Persian limes and key limes really aren't uh, suitable for growing in the ground here uh, just because they're not very cold hardy, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I have one in our yard here. Uh, it's better suited in a pot uh, as well as a Persian lime if you're going to, or, or in your orangearium. Uh, the uh, lem a true lemon uh, is also not a very cold hardy plant. The Meyer lemon is cold hardy, but it's not considered a true lemon. The calamunda, and kumquats, and lime quats are things that uh, you might want to consider here if you're planting them in your yard. We'll talk a little about the Meyer lemon. Uh, it's a very cold hardy tree. The fruit primarily matures in the fall, but uh, it, it can actually flower and fruit year round. We've had sometimes uh, three generations of fruit on our tree uh, it's a beautiful tree, 
but it does have serious thorns. So uh, if you've got little kids or uh, you have an area where you're going to be walking around it a lot, uh, you might want to be careful of one of these types of trees. Uh, it's thought to be a, a cross between a, a lemon and a sweet orange. I, don't, I presume everybody has seen what these things look like, but the fruits are fairly large. The, uh, the Meyer lemon is not as tangy or tart as a true lemon, uh, but it does have a lot more juice than, than true lemons typically do. <clears throat> so if you're going to be making a, a, a lemon pie, you might have to use twice as much of the, uh, the lemon juice as uh, opposed to a regular lemon. Uh, another popular tree that's very cold hardy in our area is the calamundin. The uh, fruit primarily matures in the fall, but it can retain on the tree for quite a while. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people use it as an ornamental tree because the fruit is very tart. Uh, however, a lot of people like to use it for jams and, and relishes and that sort of thing. The peel is sweet, but the fruit is very bitter. So the uh, IFAS recommends picking these fruits when, the, uh, when they first mature, uh, because when the, the fruit gets overripe, it tends to be very soft and the flavor is not very good. The calamundans are, are a hybrid between a mandarin orange and a kumquat. And we'll talk about kumquats next, because that's a, uh, another very popular tree to have around here. Uh, they Kumquats are, are very, very cold hardy. They can uh, withstand temperatures down to 10 degrees. And the fruit generally matures in October and the trees can continue to produce through March. Uh, it's considered like uh, a lot of people used to call it a sweet tart fruit because uh, the, the peel uh, and our rind is very sweet and the, uh, the pulp is very bitter. Uh, it's, I think, about the only citrus that's really meant to be eaten whole. Uh, when I was a child growing up here in Gainesville, that was the one tree that we had and all of the kids in the neighborhood would come around and eat the peel and, and, uh, and spit out the pulp. But the uh, kumquat does grow well in containers. There are two varieties, the nagami and the miwa. So look for both of these. They're really an excellent uh, fruit to have. Let's talk a little bit about watering and nutrition. Uh, one of the first things you should do if you're going to plant citrus in your yard, and if, if you've not done so, you ought to have a soil test. You can contact the uh, extension office and obtain a soil test kit, and it'll be sent off to IFAS. The optimal pH range for citrus is 5.5 to 6.5. If it's less than five, you might wanna add some limestone. Uh, if it's over that 6.5, you, you might be able to amend it somewhat, but it's, it's pretty difficult to change the uh, soil permanently, uh, adding sulfur or a few other things, because whatever you do, you'd have to continuously add sulfur or other uh, uh, amendments to the soil to keep that, uh, the, the pH at a higher level. Uh, the standard pH test, what they call test A, costs three dollars and the soil fertility test that's where they do ph uh, lime requirement the uh, phosphorus potassium calcium and magnesium cost ten dollars so you might want to consider doing that uh, before you you get going when you plant trees the uh, watering is very critical for your young tree so you probably should plan on using a hose for 10 15 minutes twice a week for that first month to make sure it's got plenty of water. And then look out for wilt in the afternoon and add water as needed. Uh, trees will need less watering as they mature, but you may periodically have to add some during periods of drought. But also factor in your local rainfall. Uh, do not overwater your trees because wet roots can cause fungus to grow and, uh, and they're a lot of problems that can happen with, uh, with uh, the trunk rot or root rot. Let's talk a little about nutrition. Uh, IFAS recommends an 888 analysis fertilizer with other macro and micronutrients to make sure that the fertilizer, does, fertilizer has zinc and manganese. 
you probably should plan on augmenting it with foliar sprays that have these. They recommend for a, a younger tree to fertilize about every six weeks using the amounts indicated on the label for that first year and fertilize the periods February through October. The fertilizer amounts, the actual amounts per tree will increase as the tree grows, but the frequency and application of the applications will, are gonna decrease as, the, uh, as that tree grows. Again, follow the label on the tree, uh, on the fertilizer package. Uh, don't place your fertilizer too close to the trunk. You want to encourage the feeder roots to grow and, and uh, if you put too much in the way around the, the, uh, the trunk area, it could encourage trunk rot. Fertilize lightly, just don't go more than, uh, than recommended. But I would also uh, encourage everybody, if you're planting trees, to check periodically with IFAS as recommend recommendations for fertilizer may change as they uh, evolve their research on citrus greening. I know there are many new fertilizers being tested uh, based on the citrus greening research. So sometimes this information doesn't get disseminated very rapidly, but again, look online because that may be uh, your best bet. Talk uh, about Bob. Yeah, we had a question come in on YouTube that I think would be worth um, sure. talking about because you mentioned like some plants, uh, some of the citrus do well containerized. Um, do you have a recommendation or a preference regards to what type of soil you would prefer for container plant or container planted citrus? You know, I've, I have uh, just used regular, uh, I, I don't think I would use that uh, Mel's mix. I, I mean, I've used probably yeah, a blend. Yeah. Uh, I, I've used like a, sort of a blend of some of the native soil in our area. Plus I'll throw in some other uh, uh, things similar to Mel's mix, like a little bit of peat and, and mm -hmm. other things. But, yeah, because I, I was thinking, I don't know if there's like a, like Mel's mix when people talk about for raised vegetable gardens. For citrus, I don't know if there's like a real preference or not. I think the biggest thing is drainage. Yep. So, yep. I mean, you can probably buy, Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You might have some good insight on this or Christy. Um, but soil with good grain, drainage, what I think would be the most important. Yeah, yeah, one other thing I did come to think of it, I believe I've noticed at uh, some of the big box stores, they will have uh, bags of, uh, of uh, material or, or uh, planting material for citrus. So you might look and see what uh, it, it, that has. I've, I've only got one citrus tree in a pot and uh, it is doing reasonably well, but uh, uh, it's never going to, it's, it's really, uh, it's a tree that's really meant to, to be in the ground. Uh, like some of the trees that are better in the pots are the, the, uh, the acid varieties, I think, like the, the, the limes and the calamundans and the kumquats. Because, you know, you're, you're not, if you put a, a grapefruit tree in a container, you better have a pretty big container. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about weed and pest management. And first off, let's talk about weeds. One of the things that uh, if you're talking about backyards, most folks are going to be planting the citrus tree in the turf grass area. So you need to make sure that you move, remove the grass and the weeds from underneath that tree canopy. At least create uh, at least a foot of space between the trunk and uh, where the turf is. The, uh, the mulch is generally not recommended. Uh, they usually, they, uh, the, the standard has always been to have just bare ground underneath the, uh, the, the leaf or the drip line of the tree. However, some of the recommendations because of greening seem to be changing somewhat. So you may want to consider, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more later on. So you may want to try some, uh, some mulch in there. Uh, certain types of mulch, it's high in organic matter, but always keep the mulch at least a foot away from the, uh, the trunk of the tree, just to keep uh, that, the uh, foot rot out of the way. Let's talk about pest management uh, a little bit. Uh, the, uh, we have bugs, bacteria, and fungus. And now, oh my, they're all over the place. And I was, 
we have, it seems like a, uh, more bugs and funguses and bacterias attacking our, uh, uh, our citrus trees now than, than people have ever had before. So uh, you're gonna have to be on, on the warpath. You need to monitor your, your citrus trees constantly to be on the lookout for any, uh, any, any problems with the leaves and branches and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a, a great IFAS publication, it's Citrus Problems in the Home Landscape, uh, it's IFAS Pub HS876, and all these are going to be listed in the back of the uh, presentation, but I would highly recommend uh, pulling this down if you are growing citrus trees. Uh, in our discussion, we're going to cover some of the more frequently encountered problems uh, in our area, at least the ones I've seen, uh, but first thing you're going to do when you uh, try and diagnose what the problem is. Let's look at the leaves, look at the twigs and the branches, uh, look at the trunk, especially at the base, because I've had a tree that died. It was a beautiful tree, great producer, but uh, the uh, trunk rot got to it because I probably had too much water in that area. Look at the fruit. Sometimes if the, the fruit can be, uh, uh, it'll show you what's going on. Uh, if you've got citrus canker or if you've got scab, uh, it's very, uh, very easy sometimes to diagnose what's going on there. Again, look at the IFAS pubs. You can also contact the, the Extension Office Help Desk, but uh, provide the uh, very detailed close-up pictures. Uh, I know Ann Hudson sent out a message the other day uh, that really came from Mark Frank, uh, who has given us recommendations on how to take these pictures. One of the problems we have is that people will take a picture of their citrus tree from 20 feet away and send that in, and it's pretty hard to figure out what's going on. So you really need to get up close and personal with the tree and the leaves just so we can see what's going on. <clears throat> Let's talk about some of the common disorders. Uh, deadwood and twig dieback. Some deadwood is normal, but excessive uh, dieback is, uh, it could be due to cold damage to drop or drought, you know, which is drought areas, it could be pests or diseases. Fruit drop is something that you commonly see. It can be caused by many problems uh, or, uh, or a combination. Certain cultivars like navels seem to experience fruit drop more so than others. Uh, you also sometimes may see this more in periods when you have a very hot and rainy fall. Uh, fruit splitting is something that you'll occasionally see, and it's more severe on certain cultivars like navels, uh, and it's believed to be caused to, due to excessive water coming after a dry period and also related to peel thickness because some navels can have a fairly thick peel and uh, gets dried out, and then all of a sudden you get uh, a lot of water coming in after a dry spell and uh, it's trying to grow and it causes the, the fruit to split. Sunburn uh, affects certain types of thin skin varieties, such as tangerines, uh, especially that have very thin skins, so the easy peel varieties, where they're exposed to long periods of direct sunlight. And granulation is where you have the, uh, uh, the, the pulp of the fruit uh, dries out, and sometimes prematurely, seems to impact certain larger sizes, like navels and mandarins. And I've had that on a, a red navel that I have here. It said when the harvest is delayed, it could be lack of water, certain young trees or excessive tree growth. And I think the problems I've had is just excessive tree growth more so than anything else. But uh, you know, I, I may have 50% of the fruit that is affected by granulation and yet that all the other ones are totally unaffected on that tree. Uh, here's some pictures of some cold damage. You can see where the, the, uh, uh, the leaves have died back off of uh, some of the limbs. And on the, on the far right, uh, it looks like you got a little bit of leaf miner damage. We'll cover that a little bit later on. But you do have to be a little careful. Uh, it, you know, give the tree some time. If uh, typically you want to prune the, uh, the cold damaged and dead limbs, but uh, give it a, uh, a few weeks um, after the, uh, the rest of the tree starts flushing out with leaves because you may find that it may be delayed. 
I one time I started cutting on a, a thing that I thought was dead and it really wasn't. So give it a little bit of time before you uh, you prune the uh, the dead limbs. Uh, let's talk about some more common diseases and pests. There, there are really uh, so many diseases, you have to almost be, again, have to be an optimist to think about trying to grow these trees, or at least be willing to work pretty hard. Uh, we'll talk about some of the ones that are more common around here. I really haven't seen too much of citrus canker. I've seen yellow vein chlorosis, citrus greening, I've got plenty of that. Uh, and uh, brown spot, I've never encountered that. I've had scab and I've never encountered this, but we'll talk about, uh, and greasy spot I've had as well. A look at the uh, IFAS pub HS876. They have great pictures in there along with a detailed discussion uh, of each one of these diseases uh, along with uh, how to mitigate it. You know, what's the best way to deal with these problems? Here's some more uh, ones that we've seen. Uh, sooty mold, I've seen plenty of that. Aphids, I've seen. Leaf miner, have plenty of that. Uh, if you have serious problems uh, and you, you're, you don't wanna do the spraying yourself, you might wanna consult with a, a commercial pest control service to have them spray the appropriate chemicals at the proper intervals. Uh, like I said before, if, you're, if you've got scab, uh, you have to spray uh, like a copper fungicide and or certain oils, uh, and they have to be done at the appropriate intervals, and sometimes two or three times to control the pests properly. Uh, Cistrus rust mites are around here as well, and the psyllids, which cause the greening. You'll see those. Uh, here's a picture of, of some citrus canker. The, uh, this was, used to be the, the bane of the, uh, the commercial citrus industry, and all of, uh, of the backyard citrus growers down in South Florida back probably about 15, 20 years ago, if you had a citrus tree, they had inspectors that came around from the state of Florida down in South Florida. If you had canker, they would just remove the tree. Uh, if you look, you'll see these lesions are produced on the young fruit and the leaves of the citrus. It's a bacterial disease. It's produced typically under very moist conditions and dispersed uh, by, by wind and or rains. They, uh, they enter the leaf stomates or wounds on the leaves, twigs or fruit. They, uh, the canker reduces the yields, the fruit quality and, and tends to cause leaf dieback, but uh, it can now be controlled by copper fungicides. Here's uh, some things that are fairly common around here, which are uh, leaf miners. Uh, they at attack the new flush and, and generally do not cause a whole lot of damage to mature trees. Uh, new trees are, are much more vulnerable due to frequent leaf flushes. I've used neem oil to control uh, the uh, leaf miners. The scab impacts the leaves and the fruit. Uh, you can control it with copper fungicides and that scab will really make the fruit look uh, pretty rotten. Uh, and it can actually eat up and destroy pretty much every bit of the fruit on a tree. So if, if you encounter it, uh, you might want to, to get the copper fungicide out and apply it in the, the appropriate intervals. Uh, one other thing, they say that sometimes they, they think that scab is uh, more prone to occur in trees where you have overhead irrigation. But here in Florida, uh, with all the frequent rains we have, we have nothing but overhead irrigation most of the time. The uh, orange dog caterpillars <clears throat> uh, typically don't cause a lot of damage to the, uh, your backyard type trees, but they can do damage to the commercial growers. Uh, I've occasionally found them on our trees and I just pick them off and, and put them on another host plant because they do turn into a, a, a beautiful butterfly. The giant swallowtail. Uh, they do seem to like the uh, the, uh, the citrus trees quite a bit. Um, we do have some some friendly little critters out there too, uh, such as ladybugs or lady beetles. They feed on the aphids, the mealybugs, the uh, mildews, mites, scale insects, and white flies. So they are a very beneficial insect. If you find them, uh, don't touch them. 
uh, another one is the uh, the Taxmarixia radiata wasps, which feed on the citrus psyllids. Uh, you can contact the uh, IFAS through really freshfromflorida.com, TRA, uh, and that's the website. And you can actually have them send you some of these little wasps. These wasps are about as big as a, uh, a no see -um. I mean, they're just like a little gnat and you uh, just open up the vial and let them uh, go all around your yard and they can help reduce the psyllid population. Uh, not a not a hundred percent cure, but you probably have to do it uh, uh, every year to help keep the psyllid population down. Uh, but you do be, need to be mindful if you're spraying that you don't spray at a time when you're putting these wasps out. And these wasps will stay around your area as long as the uh, as the psyllids are here. Let's talk about nutritional de deficiencies a, a bit. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to determine if the problem is due to disease or if it's really a nutritional deficiency because they can look very, very similar. And a lot of experts have been fooled by that. Uh, close inspection of the leaves is what you're going to have to do to help uh, try and figure out what the problem is. Look at the IFAS pubs because those will help uh, lead you along. The, uh, here are just some of the common ones that you see is a nitrogen deficiency. Typically the older leaves turn yellow first and then the veins uh, are slightly lighter in color. Older leaves fall from the tree and the fruit crop can be reduced in the nitrogen problem. If you have a magnesium deficiency, you typically have irregular yellow blotches on the leaves starting near the base. If, uh, if it's an acute problem, the entire leaf becomes yellow or bronze in color. An iron deficiency uh, can be caused by over irrigation and uh, the leaves tend to be lighter in color. Uh, they can also, it can be cured by adding iron chelates to your soil. Uh, zinc deficiencies uh, typically uh, can be found by looking for irregular green bands along the midrib of the leaf and the main veins are lighter in color but it, it can also be very similar to greening. Manganese deficiency looks somewhat similar to zinc or iron deficiencies and often show up in the spring after a cold winter. The foliar sprays can help with some of these and the foliar sprays you can usually uh, obtain at some of the big box stores or your nurseries around here. Here's uh, some pictures of, of uh, nutrient deficiencies. Uh, if you look on the at the picture on the upper left is a manganese deficiency and it shows the, uh, uh, the yellowing of the leaf. And again, notice how these are all fairly symmetrical as far, or at least that the manganese, the iron deficiency is a, uh, where the, the leaves are turned kind of bronze and the, the leaves are, are uh, sort of uniform in color. The zinc deficiency, again, the uh, yellowing of the, uh, the leaf uh, is uh, very symmetrical. And magnesium deficiency is again, symmetrical. The yellowing is on the outer part of the leaf. And if you look on the lower right is the citrus greening where the, the uh, yellowing is very irregular and blotchy and you do have the yellowing of the veins. So how do we go about diagnosing the problems? One of the things is, uh, Let's talk about a citrus tree itself. Uh, they do have a productive life that will diminish with time. The average lifespan is around 50 years, but it, it could be more or less depending on other factors such as disease, soil, overall care, frost issues, etc. But we talk about how old is the tree. If it's really an old tree, that may be one of the issues. It may be in not dying a natural death. What's the cultivar and rootstock of the tree? Uh, how, how was a tree planted? Was it uh, planted you know, too high, too low, uh, not deep enough? Is it root bound? Uh, is it in competition with nearby trees? Yeah, you, a little bit of too much shade will affect production. Environmental factors, light, water, and temperature. Let's, let's kind of speed up here a little bit because uh, we're 
getting close on the five o'clock hour. I know we have a little more time, but we'll get through this. The, uh, let's talk about pruning. Uh, during a first year, uh, well, typically citrus does not need to be pruned. Uh, during the first year, it's important to remove suckers from the base of the tree as this can interfere with tree development. Sometimes these suckers can grow from below the rootstock uh, area and you just wanna make sure that uh, they are removed because they're gonna diminish the, uh, the nutritious, nutrition getting to the tree. Um, also suckers that, uh, that, that uh, develop off of uh, mature trees on the limbs sh should be removed as they typically don't produce much fruit and, and detract from the productivity of the other limbs. Um, mature trees typically don't need pruning but with a few exceptions, and we'll, we'll talk about those. You want to remove the minimal amount necessary, uh, but remove the diseased or cold damaged limbs. You prune for aesthetic reasons. If you've got uh, uh, something in your yard or something too close to a house or power lines, you want to go ahead and do that. Uh, but if you're removing the uh, uh, limbs you, and or canopy, you don't want to remove more than 25% of the canopy of, uh, of a citrus tree. Uh, if all of you are master gardeners, like I, I presume that you would be, uh, we've all been through the pruning class and this shows you the, uh, the appropriate way to cut. Uh, you wanna, the, the correct cut is shown on the left where it's cut at an angle. If you cut too close, you would, uh, you might damage the trunk tissue and uh, could be attacked by rotting organisms and, and damage the tree. Uh, there's another, another shot of it. If you want to look for that, uh, the branch collar and, uh, and cut it at an appropriate angle. Let's talk now a little bit about citrus greening. Uh, citrus greening was first reported in China way back in 1919 and then noted, it was noticed in the Philippines, South Africa, and slowly worked its way here. It was first reported here in Florida in 2005, and it is now all over Florida. Uh, all varieties of citrus are affected, and even related plants such as boxwoods, which was, I didn't realize until I was uh, preparing this, this presentation, uh, are affected by, uh, by greening. Uh, a lot of the scientists thought that greening was nothing more than uh, maybe a, a zinc or manganese deficiency uh, early on. But uh, again, it, it looks very similar to a nutritional problem. And fundamentally, it is a nutritional problem because uh, the, uh, the bacteria gets into the, uh, the circulatory system of the tree and closes it down, causing the nutrition not to get up into the tree properly. But it's a, it really represents a, a pretty much an existential threat to the whole industry, uh, backyard as well as commercial, because it is so devastating. Uh, there really is no cure for, for uh, greening, but good care of trees, irrigation, weed control, fertilizer, and psyllid control can help prolong the productive life of the tree. Uh, the one of the things that uh, early on, I guess, the, uh, the, the IFAS recommended if you had greening in a tree, they wanted you to cut it down. But now the recommendation is to, is if it's not too far gone, uh, proper care might help you uh, allow the tree to live a little longer. And maybe if uh, in a few years, there will be a cure for, for greening because they're uh, really uh, having like an operation warp speed for, for greening going on in the, in the country because it's affecting not just Florida, but California and every other state that grows citrus. <clears throat> There's a, when you're trying to diagnose citrus greening, what you wanna look at is just the general health of the tree. Uh, you know, if you have a lot of dead twigs, you can see through the canopy, you've got fruit drop, off season blooms. Sometimes you see uh, the fruit is lopsided or deformed undersized. Uh, some fruits never regain proper color. Uh, you can have a color aversion where you, uh, you have fruit will, will be green at the bottom uh, first and then uh, normal coloration at the stem area, which is just the inverse of what they normally have. The leaves, as you've seen in that picture before, are 
uh, are blotchy with a mottled asymmetrical pattern, and you have yellow, yellow or corky veins. Let's look at a, a, some more pictures here. Here are some of the pictures of the leaves on the upper left showing how they're blotchy and mottled and irregular and the veins are yellowed. Uh, there's pictures of the, uh, the, on the upper right of the uh, citrus psyllids. May need to get your magnifying glass to see them, but they're feeding on that plant. Uh, and again, they typically come when the, the leaves are flush in the spring, when they're flushing out. The uh, deformed fruit is at the lower left. You can see how it's uh, uh, asymmetrical. And then you have the color inversion shown on the one on the lower, uh, lower right. And uh, I had uh, a tree that was just totally devastated by this. It was a, uh, a beautiful Hamlin tree and, and the, uh, uh, the tree was fairly young, but the uh, but greening killed it totally. Anyway, those are some, some pictures of it and a close up of the citrus psyllid, the, the uh, little evil bug. Well, can we do anything to mitigate greening? Uh, IFAS does recommend better nutrition. Consider using a control release fertilizer, sometimes called a CRF, uh, with a 12416 or as close as this as you can get. It's kind of hard to find. I went on the internet and called around trying to see if there were any other places that, that offer this. Uh, and there really aren't any in the, in the big box stores. There, are, there is a place uh, that you can buy some fertilizer, specialty fertilizer stores that will uh, sell palm tree fertilizer that's fairly close. So you might wanna look around and see if, uh, if you can find some, but also you wanna have some micronutrients in there, the uh, calcium, manganese, uh, magnesium, and zinc, uh, and watering, don't overwater. Uh, but you do want to, you might want to, to increase the frequency of watering, uh, but not overwater to make sure you don't have a, a stress brought on by drop. Uh, keep looking at the soil pH, make sure it's where it should be. Remember that your water can impact your soil pH. Uh, the optimal water should be also be between five and six. I looked on the Gainesville Regional Utilities website and it says our water pH is 8.6. So anyway, check around for fertilizers. And uh, I believe uh, in talking to Taylor a while back, he suggested that if you can't uh, find the, uh, the specialty fertilizer, and I'm sure it's probably a lot more expensive than what you find in the, in the uh, nurseries and big box stores, use just the traditional citrus fertilizer, but augment it with the uh, foliar fertilizer, because uh, that may have the micronutrients that you're looking for. Um, Here's some, some suggestions. These are uh, not the gospel according to IFAS, but uh, uh, listening to some of the, uh, the, uh, the agents out there, they said, consider, and IFAS has experimented with drenching roots with oak leaf compost tea, where you chop up oak leaves, let it sit overnight, and uh, then pour it out uh, over the, the uh, root zone of the tree. And they would do that uh, twice a week for, uh, uh, for two months. And they've noticed that that uh, seemed to mitigate the, uh, uh, the citrus greening issues. Uh, and talking to, to one of the agents, she recommended that uh, what you might wanna consider it's a little easier, per, perhaps the, the lazier person's way of doing it is just to throw some oak leaf mulch down there. Uh, and again, keep it away from the trunk of the tree, but put it all in the root zone uh, or the feeder root area in particular, because that uh, they think there may be something in there. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of growers noticed that, uh, that trees do better with a higher percentage of organic matter in your root area. Uh, IFAS isn't certain which works best, but they're, they're looking at it. Another thing growers noticed is some what they call feral trees uh, that just popped up from seeds spread by uh, animals that would eat the fruit. They noticed on the, on the edges of groves that the groves themselves may have been damaged by greening. Uh, some of these trees seem to be unaffected. And these were trees that were planted underneath oak trees or, or the, the feral trees. 
And as I mentioned to you a little earlier, I have a Hamlin orange tree in our yard that was planted under a live oak tree and it was planted under there primarily to keep it from frost damage. But this tree is seemingly uh, unaffected by, by greening, whereas every other tree in our yard has it. I mean, I have no discoloration of leaves. The fruit is, uh, uh, is very tasty. Uh, the production is not quite as, uh, as great as on trees that are out in the sunshine, but there is, uh, there is no uh, undersized or damaged fruit from greening. Um, something I, that I did learn is that citrus is actually a natural, a natural understory tree, but it does produce more when it's out there in the, uh, in the full sun. Um, I'm going to try the oak leaf mulch on our trees this year, uh, and it seems it's at least it's worth a shot. And in, uh, in addition to the fertilizer and the uh, the foliar nutrition, uh, IFAS is experimenting with some resistant cultivars. They may not be easy to find. Uh, you can check with nurseries or go online to search for them. I'm sure that there will be new ones coming along soon. So uh, look at them. You might want to, if you have an opportunity to, to try one of the fruits uh, to see what they taste like before you put them in the ground, uh, that would be worthwhile. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Um, anyway, those are some of the ones that you might want to consider. Uh, and again, keep looking online because IFAS will have new, uh, new publications as they come out. And that's pretty much the, the presentation. And my, my final thought to you is, uh, is a quote from Abraham Lincoln that uh, says, I'm an optimist because I don't see any point in being anything else. And you need to have that attitude if you're gonna be growing citrus in today's environment. So good luck to you. And, and uh, I'm sure there, there'll be plenty of questions and there'll be plenty of uh, things to learn over the course of this next year. Uh, this last slide shows the, uh, the primary references and publications that you should pull down and hang on to if you're going to be growing citrus in your yard. So with that, Taylor, it's all yours. Hey, that was good, Bob. Thank you. So I know we have um, a lot of questions that we'll get to, but I mean, um, Christy and Mark have been hammering them out throughout the presentation. I think they ended up answering, let's see here, 40 questions. <laughs> so you see they're pretty okay. busy. Yeah. And um, we were pretty active on our YouTube 